John here. Let's talk about the Z80 Retro in-system flash programmer board that I made here. So once we get to the point where we want to reprogram the boot flash on our Z80 Retro board, we have to have a way to do that. Now, if you already have a flash programmer, then great. You already know what to do. You can just use that and program your flashes. If you don't, you either got to go buy one, and they range in prices from, uh, I don't know, I've never seen one less than $20. 50 seems pretty common uh, as, as a low end, and they'll go up in, into the thousands if you, you know, if you want anything specific. With, you know, and that all seemed a little expensive to me. So I said, well, what, what do we really need to accomplish in this, in this uh, situation? And by the way, when we do it, let's make it work in system, all right? So we don't actually, if you use this board, you'll see the uh, flash can be programmed while it's actually still on the motherboard in, in, in you just pause the Z80, reflash the, the, the boot ROM, reset the Z80 and let it go all in one fell swoop. And that would actually act and behave in a lot of the same, um, you know, compile, uh, build and 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 then deploy and reboot kind of uh, iteration that you might be experienced with uh, with a uh, like a, a, a whatever the Arduino Uno type of situation or, or almost all modern system on chip type systems the SOCs right the, the socks so that you can just simply say here re reflash and retry reflash retry okay so the way this thing works uh, i'm assuming all right that all of us have a, a raspberry pi lying around somewhere okay so what this really is is it's an app an, an adapter board for a raspberry pi that costs i don't know five or six dollars all in to make this okay so this is really cheap provided you have a raspberry pi lying around now you can buy the bottom of the barrel raspberry pi for five dollars a pi zero and it'll work with this if you need one, the the Pi Zero, that's not my favorite. Not for this particular task. You'd probably be better off with a one of the regular Pi B type of uh, boards that have the forty pin header because it has to mate with this one here, right? And nowadays, you know, a Pi Two B would work, a Three B, Four B, uh, or like I said, the Zeros would also work, but. The, the problem with a zero is they don't have an Ethernet port on them, and I like hardwired Ethernet. If you want to use Wi-Fi, then great. Use yourself a nice zero W and uh, plug it in here, and, you, and if you do like them and prefer them, then you know what you're doing already. I don't have to tell you about that. So any Raspberry Pi with a 40-pin header, you can just take a ribbon cable and, 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 and connect it up to this thing, and the Raspberry Pi will run this board, and I write a little program that we can run uh, when you're done assembling or compiling your code for the Z80 boot flash. You simply copy it over to your Pi, assuming you know that you need to copy it in the first place because you can do all the compilation and development on a Pi if you wanted to, and then directly just reflash it into the retro board uh, with this thing connected up to it. So let's look and see what's going on. So this socket here that sticks out down, plugs into the header, the 40-pin header, that sticks up on the Z80 retro board, okay? So ultimately, you see it fits together like this, right? So the thing sets in, it lines up, it mates with the, with the uh, Z80 retro board. Okay, so what goes on here, all right? So what goes on here are these two MCP23017. These are I squared C to 16-bit uh, GPIO parallel port adapters. That's what these really are. These, all these parts over here are, you know, all in maybe a dollar. Okay. These, these capacitors are probably not even needed. The, the electrolytics up here, C5 and C7. I put them on there because in my prototype board, I had them on there and I'm like, whatever. I, I'm really sure it'll run without them. So if you don't have any, don't even bother. You do definitely want to have the bypass caps as usual. All right. This resistors and these two transistors here comprise what we call a level shifter. And we'll look at that in the schematic in a minute. Q3 down here is an open collector driver, much the exact same idea as the open collector driver on the reset circuit on the Z80 retro board itself. And it is this transistor that is why we need to have an open collector driver from the reset uh, circuit on the retro board uh, itself. Okay, so this is the board I was referring to if you watch the other video. 
that I was referring to when, when I said, you know, it's important to have the reset circuit generate a, a signal that's pulled down by a transistor and floats and, and is pulled up by a resistor so that we can use a wired or configuration, which is what we're really doing here, uh, or a wired and, uh, however you want to think about it, uh, so that these two boards can either one can reset the uh, the Z80 without coordinating between each other. All right, so that's what that's all about. All right, so here's a bird's eye view of the schematic. Now, if you have already ordered your boards, and some people sent me email, oh, I'm ordering boards, and I'm going to make this. Uh, yeah, that's exciting. I'm really <laughs> thrilled. I'm glad someone's getting something out of this series. I'm really happy to hear that, and if you are, Feel free to chime in and let me know. I mean, I, otherwise, you know, why am I bothering, right? So I'm having fun. I'm building one. And, and if you want to, I'd more than uh, love to hear all about it, okay? So send me notes in the comments below or become a Patreon, whatever you want to do. Send me a note. Uh, what's my point? If you built one of these, you know, before, like, I don't know, October 20th or something like that, uh, for early, I'm recording this in mid-October. So in early October, you would have, if you went over to my GitHub page at that time, you would have grabbed a Revision 1 board, okay? And this is the schematic of Revision 2. So let's first uh, mention the differences between Rev 1 and Rev 2, because if you do have a Rev 1 board, It'll it'll work sometimes, but weird things happen, and I'll tell you about why I made a mistake in a minute. The difference between the Rev 1 and Rev 2 has two things. One's optional, one's kind of required. See this reset pin on pin 18? This is an MCP 23017 chip, all right? I did not hook this up correctly. It needs to be hooked up. That's what this big line is over here, over to this pin on A2 here on both of the chips, both of these resets you can see come around, all right? Now, if you got a Rev1 board, don't throw it away, because look what's happening here. Pin 18 needs to be connected to pin 17. Well, <laughs> that's real easy to do, and in fact, it's so easy, uh, when you solder in R6 and R5, you can just use the resistor itself, the lead off of this resistor, and bend it, and connect these pins up, all right? Let's go over to the board layout, and I'll show you what I mean by that, and then we can get into the details of everything else, right? So, if you have a Rev1 board, okay, among other changes... Uh, that are otherwise, all the other changes are optional. There's only one other change that is optional. This one's pretty much not. See what's happening? Here's your R6 and here's your R5, okay? I think that's R5, right? Let's go to the silk screen layer so I can read that. Yes, so that's R5 over here. What's missing in Rev1 is this green line right there that connects 17 and 18 together. Look what happens with the tracks and where this resistor is. If you put this resistor in, you poke the two leads down, one through that hole, one through this hole. When this lead is down, uh, bend it over and take a little pliers or something and then bend an L in it so that it goes to the left and touches pin 17, comes up to 18, and then cut the lead off right here. And then just tack solder it onto pins 18, 17, and into the hole and over here to the power, all right? That's how you can turn a Rev 1 into a Rev 2 by just bending this pin. If you already put it together, just take a little piece of wire and, and or just put a solder bridge in here, right? Just put a blob of solder and connect 17 and 18 together on both of the two chips, right? They both do the exact same thing. So you can bend the lead around or just put a blob of solder or just put a little piece of wire, whatever it takes, okay? Do that and what it will do is it will, it will run more reliably is what it'll do. Mine runs without this modification, and I've been using these chips for several years without hooking up the reset bin correctly. But I've noticed on occasion that my boards, uh, basically uh, the the uh, the I squared C chips, these MCP chips, just disappear and stop working after a while. And it turns out, let's see how I got confused. Let's look at the data sheet. Here's the example of a terrible data sheet. Looks great. It's been around for a long time. These are incredibly common chips. You see them used in projects all over the place. The last time this sheet was updated, apparently, was over five, uh, five years ago. Okay? So for five years, 
This chip right here says pin 18 is an output called reset. And I saw this when I was reading the manual, and I remember, I do actually remember scratching my head going, why the heck would this generate a reset signal? Maybe it generates a signal to tell me that it is resetting itself because it has a power-up automatic reset, and there's some narrative in the document about it. And I thought, well, maybe this is something that you can use to reset other chips, yada, yada, yada. I don't know. I don't care. I'm not going to use it. I don't need it anyway. Over here, same thing. The person that put this arrow on the diagram is an idiot, okay? It turns out and so am I for taking their word for it. First impressions are so intense sometimes, right? Look what happens down here. All four of these chips are exactly the same. They come in different packages. Oh, my. So they hired a different artist to draw this one who put the arrow pointing the right way, which is what it really is. Input to the chip. And yes, if I would have also looked at this diagram over here, I would have known reset comes into the chip. And I can show you four or five other places in this document that suggests overwhelmingly obvious that reset is, in fact, an input. And it even says down here somewhere that you must externally connect the reset signal and blah, 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 blah. So what's my problem? Did I read the entire manual? Apparently not as well as I should have. And I took their word for it when I looked at the picture on the front page. So let this be a lesson to us all. All right. Uh, you're going to have to read more than... Uh, <laughs> you're going to have to make sure that the document does not conflict with itself. Okay. It is so very frustrating when this sort of thing happens. And you know what? I was Googling around when I was having trouble with these chips, you know, there's an MCP 23017, you know, problem, uh, you know, uh, you know, with I squared C crashing, all kinds of searches like that. And there are no shortage of people having trouble with this chip and having all kinds of weird problems that they can't explain. And I can only assume that I'm not the only one that saw that picture and said, okay. I don't hook up this output and short it out to something because it's an output because the sh diagram said it is. But later on, like I said, it then also suggests it's an input. And then in the narrative, it does say that you have to bias this thing. It doesn't say whether you need to bias it up or down, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, some was a jerk and it wasted an afternoon of my time to finally get to the bottom of this and the bottom of it is you need to hook the you need to pull this stupid thing up because if it floats it can accidentally reset itself and that's what was happening to me with this connected up it's 100% rock solid reliable when it's floating most of the time it will work but sometimes it'll all of a sudden just disappear and the pie can't talk to it anymore all right so i've beat up this point enough <laughs> if you have a ref1 board make sure you you connect pin 18 over here to pin 17 <laughs> otherwise it may disappear from you and frustrate you okay now the other modification i made was i added d1 and d2 it's completely optional in fact you don't need it at all in fact you can even leave the diodes off of your board if you build a rev2 board if you you if you put a jumper in J3 here. All right. Now that's not all you need to do. If you put a jumper in J3, let's look and see what that means. Okay. This here, J4 is the connector that hooks up to your Raspberry Pi through the 40 pin ribbon cable. I don't use any pins at all other than power ground and the I squared C. These two pins here, SDA and SDK with the 33s after them, uh, come up here and connect to these level shifters. I'll talk about that in a minute, okay? Uh, and then otherwise, it's just uh, hooked up to the power. Now, these two pins are the 5-volt power from the Raspberry Pi. If you put this connector in, what you're doing is you're connecting the 5-volt Raspberry Pi power to this signal here, which powers this whole board, and it powers the entire Z80 board. Okay, so when you put in J3 over here, what you're doing is you power up your Raspberry Pi, and then the entire Z80 Retro and the programmer will be powered as a peripheral device from your Raspberry Pi. And as long as you operate it that way, and that's how I operate mine when I'm, when I'm programming the Flash, by the way, then these diodes don't do anything at all, okay? 
So if that's how you're going to power it when you do your flash programming and you got a Rev1 board, all you need to do is worry about the resets if your chips crash and you don't have to care about these diodes. On the other hand, if you want to pull out Jumper 3 and power your, your Z80 and this programmer board, okay, because these 5 volts also run these chips, and you power the Z80 and these chips from a different power supply so that you can power off the Z80 while the Pi is still on or power the Pi off while this is still connected to the Z80, okay? Then you need to have these diodes, okay? Honestly, you might not need them, but I put them in as a, uh, you know, just as a cautionary uh, 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 device. Let's talk about this level shifter because it has to do with that. I squared C, which is how the Raspberry Pi, these signals come off the connector. I just talked about that. Connect up to these pins over here on these MCP chips. If you read the data sheet, the voltages required to operate these signals uh, have to be fairly close to the main power of the chip or it won't work. In other words, I can't run this at 5 and just bring in SDA and SDK at 3.3 volts off the Raspberry Pi. Okay. Honestly, I did not try it. It just simply said it won't work, so I just take their word for it, okay? Therefore, you need to put in what's called a level shifter. A lot of different ways to do this. I chose this particular way. You can buy a chip to do it. You can use NFETs like these and whatever you want. This is very common, very popular. You can find all kinds of websites to talk about how this works. I didn't invent it. Somebody else did. It's very clever and uh, really cheap and exactly what we need here. So let's talk about how this works. You'll see it's on both of the two wires from the I squared C bus from the Pi. It has a clock and it has a data line, okay? This is what we call a bi-directional level shifter. Uh, it's, they're both exactly the same, so we only need to talk about one and then you know the whole thing. Uh, the 3.3 volt line for I squared C, the way this thing works is the Raspberry Pi is an open collector driver that either shorts this to ground or lets it float if it wants to be a one or a zero, okay? Therefore, I have to put a pull-up resistor on it of some reasonable size, and 2.7K is reasonable, uh, in order to get the voltage to go high when the Raspberry Pi is not shorting it out to ground and, and sending data. And I have to pull up the 3.3 because the Raspberry Pi runs at 3.3. And if I pull this up to 5, I'll wreck the Raspberry Pi. Don't want to do that, okay? So you have to pull this thing up to 3.3. This transistor here, if you look at this little diode inside, you, there's a lot of NFETs you can use for this, tons of interchangeable ones. The 7000 is a really cheap thing. It's good enough. It works fine. Uh, just use one of those. This is an NFET with a um, uh, like a protection diode inside here, and part of the circuit requires this diode. So you need this kind of NFET to do this job, all right? So what happens is that the Raspberry Pi pulls this signal to ground, then pin 1, which is the uh, source of the transistor here, is, is going to be 3.3 volts less than pin 2, which is the gate. When that happens, this transistor goes on and connects pin 3, which is the, the, uh, the, the drain, over to pin 1, okay? And make sure that if because this is low and it's connected to ground, it'll connect this to ground over here, at which point in time, you know, this pull-up resistor, you know, it's, it's pulled to ground, so nothing's going on over here, all right? So if the price says, I want to ground this signal, it grounds it over here on this side as well. Great. If the Pi releases it, this resistor pulls it up to 3.3 volts, at which point the differential between 1 and 2 equals 0 volts, all right, because this thing floats up to 3.3, same voltage as the gate, transistor shuts off, okay? Transistor shuts off, nothing's flowing anywhere, and then this thing will be pulled up to 5 volts. So when the Pi releases it, it's at 3.3, this one's at 5, okay? That's exactly what you want. If, on the other hand, the uh, MCP chip over here is outputting a signal, it's either letting it float, which will go up to 5, or the MCP can pull it to ground if it wants to send data back to the Pi. It's the bidirectional part of this thing, okay? Well, if the MCP chip pulls it to ground, it will flow through this diode, at which point it pulls this down to ground. All right? 
at which point, you know, this transistor will actually go on because this is lower than here, but it doesn't matter. Both ends are already connected to ground anyway, so that allows the MCP to send a low signal over to the Pi and the MCP to release it, and it'll fly up high on both sides, and, and it'll also let the the pi send a low back through the other way. All right, so that's the thing, how this works. Now, why did I put this diode in here? What does this have to do with the power and blah, blah, blah? Well, what if you pull out this jumper down here and say the pi can power itself and the five volts on the retro board, you just plug the retro board into some other power supply and power it that way. Well, if you do that, then the retro board is powering the these MCP chips because they're all hooked up to the five volts that comes in off this connector over here, okay? So the Z80 can power this. In fact, if you really wanted to, you could put this jumper in and the Z80 can also power the Pi. If you don't put any power on the Pi, you put this in the Z80 can power up the entire Pi as well. It could go either way, okay? When J3 is in and the Z80 powers the Pi, or if the Pi is powering the Z80, you don't care about this diode, okay? But if G J3 is removed and you power up the Pi, and let's say you do not have the power on on the Z80, then what happens? Well, if you look at this, if this diode is not in here, what will happen is, if the pi is powered up to 3.3, this will be powered at 3.3. If the jumper's all removed and the Z80 is not powered, this is at ground because it's not powered up. If the Raspberry Pi lets this float, then this resistor here pulls it up to 3.3 volts, and this becomes uh, 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 will flow through this diode here, okay? Because if this is high volts, it'll flow through this diode over here. And it'll come out over here. It'll, this will be at 3.3 volts, okay? And remember I said this here is ground. So you have 3.3 volts here, which is more positive than your positive voltage supply on your Z80. When that happens, that's a no-no, and it could destroy this chip. And in the process, it could destroy other chips in the circuit. So the whole thing could go down like a house of cards, and you could fry all your chips. I happen to know that won't happen because I did it by accident. And it doesn't mean it won't. <laughs> it doesn't mean it'll be okay for you, too. Uh, but this sort of thing can happen. It's fairly common with I squared C and in, in some other buses like this. So sometimes chips are designed to be tolerant of this and other times they're not. And I don't know, and I don't really care. So uh, whether this particular chip is safe or not, I'm better safe than sorry is what I thought. I put this diode in over here. Now, if you put this diode in, and it goes into this situation where the power here is disconnected, therefore this is zero volts. And this thing pulls up to 3.3 and it flows through here. And I have 3.3 and zero. It'll flow through this diode. And it'll bring this up to 3.3 volts is what it'll do. At which point in time, whatever tiny amount of current flows through this resistor and does come over here will uh, be uh, the same voltage as on the power rail of all this other circuitry, at which point you're logically safe. You know, as long as the ground and the power are, uh, regardless of what the voltages are, if they're the same, which they would, roughly speaking are with a diode in here, then it's okay for that to occur in the circuit and everything will be safe and hunky-dory. And with this in here, I've run it a long time with and without power and I haven't had any problems, okay? So there's a little bit of leakage because diodes aren't perfect, nothing's perfect. There's a tiny bit of power that goes through here, but it's not a lot. And even so, it's whatever you get through a 2.7K ohm resistor and this one technically is bleeding a lot of it into the ground because this is off and the diode is and so on. So you end up with about point, I don't know, 2 to 0.5 volts over here, which is not enough to cause any real damage. 
okay and the clamping diodes inside this chip also will shunt it and do this is the same kind of a diode that's inside here anyway so uh you know the any voltage here is thrown away and prevents uh any anything bad from happening to your z80 okay so that's what those modifications are for um, this one over here, it, it, it can't happen, by the way, if you think about it. If both the Pi and the Z80 are powered up at the same time, this can never do anything. And if they both shut off at the same time, this won't do anything either. That's why this is optional. Whenever you power up the Z80 with this in here, by powering it from the Pi, or you're going the other way and you power up your Z80 and you power the Pi from the Z80. All right? I hope that all makes sense. Just program your chips with J3 in, power the Pi, and the Pi only let the entire Z80 retro board be a peripheral in that scenario of your Raspberry Pi and run the little Flash app and it'll program your, your, your Flash ROM. Okay, so let's look and see at the rest of this. Here's a transistor up here. This is the reset, the open collector driver. I talked about that at great length on how to reset your Z80 board. This is just yet another open collector driver that can assert the reset signal, the same as the one on the main board. So either one of these or both can reset the Z80 whenever you want. This one here is connected up to one of the pins on this GPIO expander chip. So the Raspberry Pi can control this transistor, and therefore the Raspberry Pi can reset your Z80. The Raspberry Pi can control every one of these signals. It can make them be inputs or outputs from the perspective of the Raspberry Pi, and one of which is bus requests, right? So what we can do is we can power this whole thing up, initialize these chips. The Raspberry Pi can assert bus request and either wait for bus act to come back or just wait a little while, because no matter what, if you look at the specs of the Z80, if no one ever generates any wait states, then in theory, the Z80 absolutely must respond with a bus acknowledgement within 5T cycles in the worst case delay, which is 5 10 millionths of one second. And I can assure you it takes the Raspberry Pi a thousand times that long just to ask this chip to tell it what the value is on BUSAC. So the mere fact that the Raspberry Pi asserts bus request will guarantee that the Z80 will give it the bus before the Pi can do anything else whatsoever. And it's not because your Pi is slow. It's because I squared C is slow. This will be running at like 400 kilohertz while the t cycles in the z80 are running at 10 megahertz so no <laughs> if the pi says give me the bus the pi can immediately start using the bus without even asking if it has it why because it will by definition you can see this one over here is connected up to all the address lines and I hooked these up in order to make the firmware, uh, the, you know, the application program in the Raspberry Pi will be easier for us to write. Because if you just attach the address lines in random order, you're going to have to be shifting and anding and oring and reordering all the bits every single time you want to move data onto the address bus. As it is right now, the address bus has two bytes in it. So if I say I want to program a 16-bit number, I can take the least significant eight bits and put it out of... Uh, GPIO port B and the most significant 8 bits out of GPIO port A and I don't have to jostle them around. I can just stick it on there and it will assert that that's the address on the Z80. Same thing for the data lines. I strategically connected them to port A over here on this chip so that it, the, the uh, they can be programmed to be written from the Pi onto the data bus, or the Pi can program these things to say, I want to let the Pi see the value that's on the data bus. Same thing's true with all these as well. The Pi can send data out on these lines, or the Pi can ask, oh, what's the Z80 generating all these lines right now, okay? This M1 I put on here without really thinking. You don't want to use this. Uh, it turns out that the the uh, if you plug this onto a Z80 retro board and you have the Z80 chip in the retro board, you do not want to assert any signals on here because the Z80 will not grant... Uh, what do you want to say? When, if and when the Raspberry Pi does a bus request... 
as I explained earlier on how the Z80 controls stuff, that tells the Z80, when the Z80 says, okay, I'm acknowledging it, what that means is the Z80 lets me control at that point all the data lines, all the address lines, and these four lines here, okay? The Z80 never relinquishes M1, all right? So while that is connected up here, you, if you use it for anything at all, you really need to use M1 as an input bit only, okay? Uh, we don't need it for the Flash programmer at all, okay? Uh, what you need to do when you're programming the Flash, when we get to the firmware, I'll explain it at that point, the firmware, the Flash programming application, I should say. Uh, we need M1 to be high when we're programming the Flash. And, well, when the Z80 gives you a bus acknowledgement, it is high and stays high. So, by default, M1 is the way we need it to be. I got lucky on that one, I guess, right? But, I mean, it only makes sense. That's really how the thing works. Anyhow, uh, and once we have the bus the Raspberry Pi can now play around with these signals. It can, uh, you know, make all of these signals are high. Then the Raspberry Pi can put out an address and uh, send some data out, and then it can generate a low on MREC and a low on read, or rather a low on the write signal. If it's, if it's sending an address and it's sending data, it can uh, assert MREC as true by lowering it in, in lowering write, and it will have then uh, a write transaction will take place on the Z80 uh, retro board bus, and therefore the Pi can write anything it wants into the memory, or it can write into the flash, or it can read from the memory, or it can read from the flash, and that's our main goal. All right, so this is how this thing is connected, and when we get to how this whole thing works i'll do another video on how the software on the pi uh works and how to use it to program the the flash on the z80 retro so this is what this board does if you buy the board at the same time you buy your z80 retro board okay this is a, a two-sided board and it's uh less than 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters and if you bought it, like I bought mine from JLCPCB. I don't have any sponsor from them, so this is not a sponsor thing. I just happen to buy there. I'm just disclosing that. It cost me $2 for that board. You get five of them, right? You got to buy five. You want one, you get five, right? So for $2, in addition to the huge overpriced $8 um, uh, Z80 retro board, so a total of $10, I get five retros and five of these flash boards. And then I can, uh, as I think I mentioned this before, you can then combine your shipping and pay only one round of shipping. And I think the shipping is actually about $12. So for $22, you get <laughs> 10 boards and you get you know the thing delivered in three days from overseas. That's a, a bargain I don't that I've never thought I'd ever see in my lifetime. So anyway, it's a really good price. And if you get together with a couple of friends, you know, then you all get a bunch of boards and you can all chip in. And for like, uh, you know, less money than the cost of one Z80, you can get all you can get a pair of boards uh, in a group of people if you team up. All right. So that's the Z80 uh, uh, in 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 circuit flash programmer that I came up with. It works. I've tested it out in Rev One. Win. It works really much better if you connect the reset lines like this. Uh, but you no, know, it works fine. And uh, the software is also in the same repo as, by the way, the schematics. It's in a directory called Pi. And if you click on this directory, you see a couple of files. There's a make file, a little debug header uh, that I like to use uh, that I wrote, and this flash uh, source code here. I'll go over how this all works in another video. But the short of it is type make, because all you need to do this is a single file executable. It's very straightforward. It initializes the I squared C bus and just starts sending commands to those chips. And it reads from standard in, as you can clearly see in this line of code. Here's here you run it. You compile this, and it generates an executable file in the same directory called Flash. There's nothing to install. Just run it from here or wherever you, you know, compiled it. And then you say less than sign. Uh, and, and of course, on, on your Raspberry Pi, this is a Unix thing. And you then give it the name of the file that has your binary data in it that you need to put in the flash chip, as simple as that. And it prints a bunch of stuff, debug junk as it goes, so you can sort of see what it's doing, all right? And that's all there is to it.
So I think we're just about ready to start writing actual code and firing up and running on our retro board. See you next time.